Hello, today is April 14th, 2015. We're meeting today with Mr. Guy Coombs at his home in Fort Collins, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Guy, and thanks for sitting down today to, to tell your story. Thank you for having me. Let's start out, if we could, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you're born, a little bit about your family. Well, um, uh, my date of birth is uh, 11 November 1941. I was born in Rockville Center, New York. That's on Long Island. I have an older sister, a younger brother. Um, attended school in Long Beach, uh, Long Island. That's on the South Shore, right on the Atlantic Ocean. Graduated from Long Beach High School. Went to the Academy of Aeronautics at LaGuardia Field in New York for a year and uh, left there and joined the United States Air Force. With, in both cases with hopes of being a pilot or what was, uh, how'd you get into aeronautics? No, I got into uh, the Air Force and I went to radio maintenance school, tech school. So my career was in uh, the radio maintenance area. What, uh, I mean, pro after high school, you went, you said you went aeronautics school? Was Academy it? of Aeronautics. And First you had the basic courses, uh, what? drafting, uh, some aerospace basics, and then decided that that wasn't for me, and I uh, joined the Air Force. Okay, all right. What, what year did you join the Air I Force? I joined the Air Force in April of 1960, and went to basic training at Lackland Air Force Base. Uh, went to Keesler Air Force Base for radio maintenance school. While I was at Keesler, a representative from United States Air Force Security Service visited the class and was uh, soliciting volunteers for some security service assignments. Some of those assignments were in Turkey, Pakistan, Alaska. Oh. Guys were jumping up, raising their hands, saying they'd take that. They wanted to get that one year assignment out of the way in hopes of getting a follow on close to their home. When the gentleman asked if there was anybody that would be interested in a three year tour in Scotland, I jumped up <laughs> and volunteered for that. And, uh, and uh, after security clearance and everything came through, I got the assignment. Now, when you joined the Air Force, was there a thought of making it a career or are you just going in for... No, there wasn't a thought of making it a career at the time. Uh, that came uh, a few years later. So I was assigned to a uh, security service installation, RAF Kirk Newton, which was about 11 miles outside of the city of Edinburgh, Scotland. And uh, what, what was the appeal to Scotland over those other assignments that they were talking about that uh, made you jump? My sister had dated a Scottish young man and we had heard lots of stories about Scotland and Ireland. And it just appealed to me, Edinburgh, Scotland, uh, you know, a, a big city, a beautiful country. And uh, so we took it. And fortunately, I got it. And uh, in 1963, while I was stationed there, I uh, met my wife and got married <laughs> and completed a three-year tour at uh, Kirk Newton and was up for re-enlistment. And... Uh, Re-enlisted and follow-on assignment was in Cutbank, Montana. The radar site in Cutbank, Montana, and we maintained the ground-to-air radios, uh, which were located about 12, 14 miles from the main radar site, right along the Canadian border. In fact, we were so close to the Canadian border that we delivered the mail to the border guards <laughs> on our way to the radio site. <laughs> Now, is this the type of work you were doing in Scotland as well? What Same type, maintaining radios, uh, repair. And uh, after about 10 months in Cutbank, Montana, and the worst winters you could ever imagine, <laughs> um, the Air Force decided to close down the radar site in Cutbank, Montana. Thought, wow, now we're going to get us a good assignment. They moved me 120 miles away to Mount Sam Air Force Base at Great Falls. At Great Falls, I was with the uh, uh, NORAD, and uh, we were doing evaluations of all of the uh, Dewline radar sites and their radio communications. 
following a year at, or two years at Malmstrom Air Force Base, I was reassigned to the 2876 GIA Ground Electronics Engineering Installations Agency in the Philippines. Oh, uh, that was supposed to be an accompanied tour. However, at that time, uh, accompanied tour didn't mean your wife and family traveled with you. They met you when you moved high enough up on the list to get housing. And uh, so consequently, I was in the Philippines for a year on my own before my wife joined me and my children. And they came over from Scotland to the Philippines. I remember on one of my uh, uh, trips into Vietnam where I installed control towers at Benoit, Ben Tui, and Phan Rang Air Base. I got back to Clark Air Base in the Philippines to assemble all of the necessary equipment and paperwork and bits and pieces for my next installation. And the colonel called me into his office and he told me that my wife's travel was of presidential interest. I, he said, what's this all about? I said, I have no idea. He said, well, I got a message from Washington that said your wife's travel is of presidential interest. Huh. As it turned out, well, I was moving up the lists in the Philippines to get housing. My wife was in Scotland with our children and wasn't getting an information that she required to eventually accompany me in the Philippines. So she went to the consulate's office in Edinburgh one day and barged in there a, a bit upset about some issues. And the consulate was, uh, visiting with a friend of his who had been in at the Manila Peace Talks with President Johnson. And uh, the consulate got up out of his seat and wanted to know what's going on. And the president's representative said, just stay still and asked my wife what the problem was. And she relayed to him that uh, she was having difficulty getting uh, pay and benefits and medical treatment and knowing where I am and what his status of travel is and one thing and another. So that was the <laughs> connection to the presidential interest. Eventually my wife and children did accompany, did arrive in the Philippines. They got an embassy flight out of, uh, that originated in Charleston, South Carolina and was supposed to go to, to uh, Torrejon in Spain and then on to Saudi Arabia and Pakistan and India and Vietnam and eventually Clark Air Base. Well, having been in Scotland for a year on, with her parents, Joan didn't have the, the necessary documents oh. in order. So when she got to Madrid and Tarahon Air Base, uh, the people at the desk looked over all the paperwork and they said, Mrs. Coombs, you children don't have the proper documentation and uh, they needed a visa for India or Pakistan, one or the other. <clears throat> and it was for my daughter who was born in Cutbank, Montana, but she was a U.S. citizen. My son, who was born in Edinburgh, Scotland, has a British citizenship and my wife has her British citizenship. So traveling into those countries was no problem for them. So they lo the officials at Torahone loaded my wife and children into a car and took her down to the embassy and rushed through all the paperwork and got the necessary documents. And they get back out to Torahone and uh, check in and the papers all got checked over and everything was fine. And uh, they said, the plane is waiting for you at Charleston, South Carolina. Now they thought she was gonna get on at Charleston. Well, no, in fact, she was gonna board the plane in Madrid. Uh, eventually the plane arrived in Madrid. They got on, spent a night in India and route to uh, the Philippines with a stop in uh, Bangkok and Saigon, oh, wow. where my wife wanted to get off the plane and they were, she was informed that if uh, the GIs didn't get you, that the Viet Cong would. Oh, so, yeah. so they stayed on the plane in Saigon and eventually arrived at Clark Air Base 
then we moved into our home there. Oh, what an adventure. Okay. To join more lists, a list to get a refrigerator, a list to get a sewing machine, a list to get this, a list to get that. That's just the way it was in those days when you were on a semi-accompanied tour. Okay. So while I was with the uh, 2876 G Squadron, I uh, had sold the control towers, Ben Wah, Ben Tui, Fan Rang Air Base, as I said. What, roughly what year time period was this? Uh, that would have been in 66 to 68. Things were starting to really ramp up in Vietnam. Yes, and, yeah. yes. Uh, out of the Philippines, we did uh, communications installations projects in Taiwan, uh, Bangkok, Vietnam, Thailand, wow. Guam, uh, and the Philippines. Uh, most of the Air Force installations we either did upgrades or installed new equipment. The uh, primary thing, in my estimation, was the control tower at Phan Rang Air Base in Vietnam. It was a control tower that the Air Force bought from the FAA that had been programmed to go in someplace in Oklahoma, I believe. And that control tower from the Anything above the cement slab was packed up in the U.S. and shipped to Vietnam, and then we showed up to install it and assemble and install all the communications equipment. When we completed with the installations and all of the checkout, then the FAA would come in and flight check the system just as they would at JFK or Dulles or uh, any U.S. airport. So uh, it was very satisfying uh, to get those jobs accomplished. How, how was that, uh, I mean, some of these other installations around Southeast Asia were, were fine, but I mean, you were in a war zone. What was, uh, what was it like when you were doing the, the Vietnam installs? Uh, uh, you could hear a lot of action uh, around the bases where it was stationed. Um, you could see a lot of the activity because we were up in the control tower and we could see the aircraft taking off and landing and the rescue helicopters coming in and uh, medevacs. Uh, in fact, when we were at Bentui Air Base, uh, they were looking for volunteers to uh, go up on the A1Es and drop flares on night missions. And I volunteered like a fool. <laughs> and uh, was, my time came up, my day to, to go up and drop flares. And I went to base ops and they said, well, we don't have anything on the schedule right now. So, uh, why don't you just go over to the, the uh, club and to go to the movie and we'll call you. Well, about halfway through a movie, they called me. And they went down to base ops and the pilot was there and he was uh, all in his gear and a parachute on him and takes me out to the A1E and he says, here's what we're going to do. And he explains it all. And he's, the pilot is up front and then there's a kind of a firewall with a stack of flares and a folding chair and a hole in the floor. And he's telling me that when he gives me the signal and I got a headset on and now I have a parachute on and a 45, oh, he says, you take the flares, put them in the hole, hold the ring and let them go. There's no problem. He says, if we take a hit, I'll roll the plane, blow the canopy and you just roll out and don't forget to take, you know, have your weapon. Oh, jeez. I said, okay, and I'm beginning to think twice about this because I have a family back uh -huh. that hasn't come over to join me yet in the Philippines. And uh, we got in the plane and he fired up the engines and revved them up and taxied down the end of the runway and hitting full throttle and we're rolling down the runway and all of a sudden he backs off. The mission was canceled. So that was... Uh, that was that. <laughs> I didn't volunteer too much for anything else after that. <laughs> um, when we left the Philippines, got reassigned to Minot Air Force Base, North Dakota. So that's Cut Bank, Great Falls, <laughs> right. stop in the Philippines and run around Southeast Asia, and now Minot, North Dakota, oh, boy. where I was in maintenance control and uh, did all the uh, dispatching of maintenance teams out to uh, the missile silos and maintenance on the radios and what have you. So uh, 
about halfway through that tour at Minot Air Force Base, I thought, I got to take control of my career. And I had heard about an organization called the Air Force Office of Special Investigations. And they had a, a division, Technical Services Division, which was about 120 people worldwide, mm. all in locations where families were accompanied the agents. So I volunteered for that and was accepted and went to OSI training, special agent training, in Washington in the old temporary buildings that were along the mall. In fact, our school was in Temple E, which was the last temporary building demolished. And that would be in uh, 1970. In 1970, I graduated from uh, uh, agent, special agent training. Uh, I was given my badge. We got a $300 clothing allowance to go out and buy a suit. Is any crook worth catching? It's worth catching in a Robert Hall suit. Right? So uh, that was the start of my 10 years with the Air Force Office of Special Investigations. And what, 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 talk about primarily what, what kind of work you would do in that. In, in the Technical Services Division, we were mainly supporting the Air Force Technical Surveillance Countermeasures Program, where we would perform technical security surveys in locations where the Air Force had sensitive compartmented information or cryptographic information to make sure that the areas hadn't been compromised uh, physically, uh, that their personnel security protective measures were up to snuff, that there were no technical issues with any of the equipment that was being utilized, which could be compromised by hostile intelligence agents that got close to it. Oh, sounds like fascinating. So work. we did that, and then our secondary mission was to support the other agents in the conduct of their cr criminal fraud and counterintelligence investigations. In that respect, they were running an investigation, a criminal investigation involving drugs, for instance, and the agents needed technical support. They would contact our office and we would take a look at their case, see what they had, what type of evidence were they were trying to obtain, and determine whether any of our technical capabilities could assist them in their investigation, being wiretaps, eavesdrops, clandestine surveillance, surreptitious entry, things of that nature. So we supported a, a, a large number of those cases. After two years at Travis Air Force Base, was reassigned to District 70 OSI at Wiesbaden Air Base in Germany. They were in Germany for four years, hmm. and uh, we supported the agents and ran technical security surveys throughout Europe, the United Kingdom, Germany, Belgium, Holland, Norway, Italy, Spain, France, wherever there was a U.S. installation that had uh, compartmented information that needed to be protected, we went in to ensure that it was being protected. Now, did you have a specialty in, in, on the team? Or what, what was your primary responsibilities? Well, having only been in the field in the OSI for two years, I didn't have a whole lot of experience, but I gained it rapidly at District 70 in Germany. Uh, there were some seasoned agents there who were running some highly sensitive cases. Um, some that other U.S. intelligence services wouldn't touch. They said it was too risky, it couldn't be done. Uh, OSI said, yeah, let our guys take a look at it. We'd take a look at it, look at all the information that was available and determine whether our skills could assist in gathering information that was required. And we did so. Wow. And uh, kind of gained a reputation as the kind of guy that could get it done. I remember one, uh, can't talk too much about it sure. because it's a classification. Sure. But one case, uh, I came home, uh, came home from one trip, was called down to the commander's office and he had an envelope and myself and another agent by the name of Bert Hall were there. 
And uh, he opened the envelope and it was from Washington. And it said that we were to prepare to travel. Not to say anything to anyone other than our commander. Okay, so the guys you work with, and there was only 15 of us at Wiesbaden Air Base, they didn't know what was going on. Your family doesn't know what's going on. You don't know what's going on wow. because you haven't had to follow on. It just says prepare. So Bert and I looked at each other and we said, okay, we pick, uh, prepare. Well, the bottom of the message said to Guy, don't forget your shaving kit. I tried to figure out what that's all about and uh, didn't quite get, get it, put it all together until some, about a month later when a second package came in from Washington that had plane tickets on it and very limited information about where we were going. We knew the ultimate the destination, uh, but not much about the case. And again, it said, don't forget your shaving kit. Okay. Well, it finally dawned on me, the shaving kit had a disguise in it. Oh, so wow. they wanted me to, to go on this trip and to uh, not to get, forget to bring my disguise. Wow. So I took the shaving kit and some other things and by this time, I was able to let my wife know that I was going someplace, and I didn't know when I'd be back. The colonel I directly worked for didn't know a thing. The other agents in the division, technical services, they didn't know anything. So one day, I don't show up for work, and I'm gone for a couple of months. Wow. And uh, ultimately, we ended up in Athens, Greece, where we were running a, uh, a counterintelligence investigation. and. Uh, while we were there, we were, uh, I guess you would call it undercover. We were uh, posing as school teachers from the U.S. on a summer break. And uh, of course, when you're a school teacher on your summer break, you have to play the role. So we did a lot of scuba diving, uh, renting fancy cars and apartments on the beach. And we did most of our work uh, between the hours of darkness when we uh, built some surveillance devices that we were able to install and uh, obtain the evidence that was needed in the investigation. Now, would this all be internal Air Force work? I mean... Uh... Yeah, the Air Force has jurisdiction over the, all the U.S. military and civilians working for the military in overseas locations. Okay. okay. There's always disputes about jurisdiction. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Whose cases... Exactly, that was the point of my question, you know, yeah. the CIA or... or you well, know what? we worked with them. Yeah. Uh, in fact, they uh, they provided the disguise. <laughs> um, but we worked with them and uh, closely with the State Department and other agencies to make sure that everybody was in lockstep on where we were going. Okay. That case in Germany was a very high-profile case and turned out successful. And as a result of that, I believe. In 1976, I was asked if I would become the first OSI enlisted division chief and take over the district technical services division at Lowry Air Force Base in Aurora, Colorado. Well, I had been to Lowry a number of times while I was stationed in California because we used to cover the 14 western states doing our surveys and supporting agents that needed assistance technically. So uh, I was familiar with the area and I said, you bet. You know, so it was quite an honor to be uh, selected as the first enlisted division oh, yeah, yeah. And I can only attribute that to uh, the work that uh, I was able to accomplish both at Travis Air Force Base and in Europe between 1972 and 1976. Um, took over the division at Lowry. At, by this time, there had been some reorganization within OSI. We were responsible for providing support to agents in Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, and that was it. And uh, we did technical security surveys on all the Air Force installations annually. Uh, we supported all of the criminal fraud counterintelligence investigations and uh, 
amongst some of the facilities that we visited on a regular basis were contracted facilities that were on contract with the United States Air Force. Uh, that being uh, Martin Marietta outside of Denver. Spent a lot of time at Martin Marietta behind the doors in their secure areas performing surveys and uh, got a reputation out there for the work that I was doing and always went a little above and beyond. You'd always be asked, you know, can you check the president's telephone? And could you just look in his office for 15 minutes and tell us what you think? And I would relay my thoughts about, you know, whatever he's doing could be compromised because of the way the paperwork was handled and no security or what have you. So in uh, 1980, I was selected for E-8. I was also notified by OSI that they had an assignment for me in Turkey, uh, which I didn't want to go to. Uh, Lockheed Martin, or Martin Marietta at the time, said, hey, why don't you just come out here? We have a place for you. So I retired from uh, the Air Force in April of 1980 on a Friday and went to work on a Monday at Martin Marietta. <laughs> wow. Uh, a lot of it had to do with the security clearances I had because we were doing all this work in the Air Force. You had virtually every security clearance and special access that anybody has. And uh, behind the closed doors on some of the classified projects that Martin Marietta was involved in, they needed people that had security clearances. So with my security background, my security clearances, I was uh, with Martin Marietta working on the mission integration support contract where we were integrating classified payloads into the space shuttle program and coming up with the security policy and procedures to conceal the identity and the mission of the projects that were ongoing that were going to fly on the space shuttle. So I did that for uh, about five years with Lockheed Martin, maybe six, and then I was assigned to the Evolved Expendable Launch Vehicle Program. Martin Marietta by this time had merged with Lockheed. We were Lockheed Martin. We were moving the Atlas program from San Diego, General Dynamics, to uh, Martin Marietta. General Dynamics had made introductions and inroads with a company called Energomash in the Soviet Union, in Mos outside of Moscow. Um, one of the, they were pursuing the purchase of rocket engines and rocket engine technology from the Russians. By this time, the war was down, and you know we were all going to be cooperating and helping one another. And uh, Martin Marietta said, uh, "Guy, why don't you go out to San Diego and sit in on a meeting that they're having with their Russian counterparts, and just get a feel for what's going on?" So I did that, and I went back, and reported back to the Vice President of Space Launch Systems, and. Uh, he said, uh, we're going to move that program to Denver, and uh, would you be able to be willing to be our security interface with NPO and Ergamash in, outside of Russia, of mm -hmm. Moscow? Wow. <clears throat> so uh, I was able to do that. I spent a lot of time in Moscow, traveling back and forth. Um, we would attend all of the technical interchanges with the engineers. And the president's policy said, uh, you know, we can pursue our rocket engine technology and team with these companies, but we were to get as much from them, but we couldn't provide anything that would improve their capability. So if our engineers are sitting together with their engineers and they're talking about developing a rocket engine and the engineers cross certain boundaries, you'd stop the meeting. You can't go there. So it got to be very interesting, and the Russian, my Russian counterpart, a gentleman by the name of Vasily Vakulin, uh, who happened to turn out to be an ex-KGB agent, wow. he was uh, NPO and Ergamash's security representative. 
So when Fasili and his people would come to the U.S. for technical interchanges, I would meet them and bring them, take them to Target and Walmart. And <laughs> they'd want to buy all of these things. And then uh, on one occasion, I had them to my home, and uh, they uh, for a barbecue, and they were looking at some of the memorabilia in my house. And one of them gave me an elbow, and he said, "Guy, he said we know about your background." And I said, well, Felix, I'd be disappointed if you didn't, because we know about yours. Okay. But uh, they were just regular guys, like myself, trying to do a job. Yeah. We became great friends. Uh, when I'd go to Moscow, they would be there at the airport to meet me when I got off the plane, to take me wherever I wanted to go. On one occasion, we had uh, a visit from the Secretary of the Air Force, Darlene Drurian, and her staff who were over to evaluate Energomash's ability to meet our technical schedule and cost objectives. And uh, in preparation for Darlene Julian's visit, I was sent over ahead of time to coordinate with my counterpart, Vasily, to make sure that everything was in order for the Secretary of the Air Force. She had expressed a desire to go to the Bolshoi Ballet she wanted to go to the circus. She wanted to go to the Red Square. And uh, I talked with Vasily about it through interpreters. And all of that was arranged, okay? in addition to the technical interchanges that took place and the test firing of one of their engines. Okay? And they test fire our engines right in the metropolis area. Um, not like we do at Marshall Air Force Base in uh, the US, where you 30 miles from the nearest yeah. anything when they fire an engine. Uh, Nergomash fires them indoors in a chamber uh, two blocks from residential area. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, it was quite an experience. Um, so we did that, we worked the space shuttle program. We bought 101 RD 180 uh, rocket engines from NPO and Nergomash for a billion dollars. In exchange, they had to ex exchange technology to us so that theoretically we could build the identical engine here in the United States, and that would be done by Aerojet. Um, as it turned out, we got most of the information that was required, but we never built any engines here in the United States. They continue to build them today in at Energomash's headquarters in Kipke, which is right outside of Moscow. So their technology is, was better than ours? Their technology, if you compare a re, uh, Aerojet rocket engine alongside of the Nergomash's RD-180, it's like a Clydesdale horse and a thoroughbred. Really? Uh, we would do everything within our power to cut down on the weight associated with the engine. Because the less weight you have in the engine, the more you can have in the payload. The Russians took a different approach and they beefed up the engines so that they were robust. They couldn't launch as heavy a satellite as we could and their techno satellite technology was not quite where ours was where theirs wouldn't last on orbit as long. We would put a satellite up with an expected life expectancy of uh, three to five years and 15 years later they're still operating. Uh, that doesn't happen with Soviet satellites. So they had to launch a lot more than we did. Consequently, they built robust engines. Okay. The RD-180 program is very successful. Uh, today, the Atlas launch vehicle flies with RD-180 engines that come from Moscow. Um, in fact, I believe there's a launch coming up here in a couple of weeks. It'll be an Atlas V and it'll have RD-180 engines on hmm. it. I had a part in, in that program. Hmm. Um, in 1980, things were starting to scale back. Government funding was getting hmm. tight. Lockheed Martin was letting people go. I was in an administrative position working for a vice president. And uh, word came down that early retirements were available. Uh, 1990. This was in 1990. 1989. Okay, so I thought you said 1980 earlier. 1980. Okay, okay. 
1980, uh, uh, I retired from here. Right, that's right. Uh, 19, no, 1998, I retired from Lockheed Martin. Okay. okay. Uh, what do we do when we retire from Lockheed Martin? Well, we add that pension on top of the Air Force pension, and now we got two pensions. And you're getting older, so you're going to be eligible for Social Security. My wife and I decided that we would like to spend more time in Scotland, so we uh, looked around and thought about, well, maybe we'll do a little bed and breakfast. We went over on one trip, and we looked at a place, and uh, it was in the highlands of Scotland, right on the south shore of Loch Ness, and uh, it was a 15 living room hotel, restaurant, and a pub. Well, we looked at that and thought, boy, this, this would be something, wouldn't it? And uh, it's not exactly a small bed and breakfast. It's a little <laughs> more than we thought it was going to be. And I had gone over there and in anticipation of possibly being able to do something, had all of my financial data and everything with me. So I went to the Royal Bank of Scotland and talked to one of the loan officers and told him who I was and where I'd been and what I did and what I wanted to do. Uh -oh. <laughs> and... Uh, about three days later, I get a call and said, well, your mortgage has been approved if you want to buy that hotel. So we bought that hotel and uh, moved back to Scotland. And we ran that hotel for eight years. Uh, had a number of visitors from Lockheed Martin, uh, from different Air Force organizations, uh, astronauts came to stay with us, uh, movie stars uh, came and stayed at the hotel. It was quite an experience. Wow. Um, perhaps the, the most memorable experience over there was in September of 2002 when my wife and I brought three New York firemen, a policeman and their wives, over to Scotland for two weeks, all expenses paid. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't have gotten better cooperation from locals and business establishments and uh, just everyone in putting that together. And uh, Richard Branson and Virgin Atlantic flew the, the, uh, the visitors from Newark to London. British Airways flew them from London to Inverness, Scotland. Uh, we picked them up at Inverness in vehicles which were supplied to me at no charge by Mercedes-Benz who I had purchased my vehicle from over there to support the hotel. So uh, that was quite an experience and uh, uh, just just made you feel good all over to be yeah. able to do something like that. Yeah, right, right. Okay. So after eight years of uh, looking after other people and working from seven in the morning until all hours of the night, uh, if you have a guest in the hotel, be it one guest or, or a house full, you treat them all the same. If that guest wants to sit in the pub and talk about war stories and where he's been and where he's going and, and drink my beer, well then I'm there to serve him the beer and listen to him. So they're long days, uh, seasonal, but there's always somebody there. So you're there all the time as well. In uh, December of 2005, we sold the hotel and moved back to Fort Collins where we had a son here and his family, and we've been here since. Wow. So, retired, retired, retired. <laughs> uh, now I play golf and, uh, and uh, visit with grandchildren. Yeah, and, and, and so let's talk a little bit about family, uh, your, your kids and grandkids. And uh, Well, as I mentioned, I met my wife in 1963. We married, had a son born in Edinburgh, Scotland. We moved to Cutbank, Montana on our first assignment, and our daughter was born there. Um, second son, youngest son, was born in Germany while we were there. He was born on a U.S. military installation, so he doesn't have dual passports or anything like that. Um, both sons are here in Fort Collins. My daughter is not with us anymore. Oh. Um, Grandchildren, the one uh, that goes to Fossil Ridge uh, High School at the present time, he's a senior, will graduate in May, and is going to be uh, 
attending CSU Pueblo on a football scholarship. Uh, granddaughter and her partner and they gave birth last November to our first great-grandchild uh, who's now four and a half months old. She's already ready made her first trip to Paris <laughs> and loved it. Uh, and we love her and uh, that's about it. Oh, wow, wow. Boy, you, you look it's back. It's been a nice ride. Oh, incredible ride. A fascinating yeah. ride, I would imagine. Yeah. Uh, every, everything you talked about just sounds like a, a it, fascinating life. Been so many places and done so many things and uh, had so much support from my wife and uh, taking care of the kids and taking care of things at home when I'm running off supporting an agent that's got a drug investigation or putting in the radios in Utapau, uh, Bangkok. Uh, you know, she was always there and I knew, knew that. And uh, when I got home, there was always a, a good meal and welcome home. Oh, wow. Uh, wow. Well, guys, as we, as we start to wind down this interview, uh, I know I didn't ask a whole lot of questions, but is there anything I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about? Um, well, I guess one thing I like, uh, through the years, have, have you kept in touch with some of these guys you've served with or any sort of reunions? Uh, I have kept happened? in touch with a number of them. The, uh, primarily the people that, uh, other OSI agents that are mm -hmm. now retired that were in the technical services area as well. There are some that uh, agents that were not in technical services that uh, we touch base every now and then but not any close relationship. Oh, okay, yeah, no sort of reunions or anything? No, like no, okay. no. There was an organization, Retired uh, Special Agents Association, and it just provided you a list of who mm. and where they're living now and what the years they served and that kind of thing. But there weren't any reunions to speak mm. of. Mm. And you're still... Uh, I think the only reunion that uh, might be coming up is uh, with the people from NPO and Ergamash when uh, on one of my trips, they give me a, a Russian bear holding a bottle of vodka. Yeah. And we all vowed that we would get together at Kennedy Space Center when they launched an Atlas vehicle with RD-180 engines and cracked that bottle of vodka. Oh, wow. And it's sitting up there on the yeah, right. shelf uh, with the bear protecting it. <laughs> so that, that'll that be a nice reunion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, people I worked with in Lockheed Martin, I see a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah. And when we had the hotel, we had quite a large number of visitors. I'll bet, yeah, I'll bet. Yeah, yeah. wow. I remember the visit from Dan Coates, who uh, he flew on three shuttle missions. He brought his family over for a week. Wow. Lots of stories. Yeah, I'll bet. Oh, boy. Uh, uh, and like I think you alluded to it earlier, you, you're still under uh, um, classification. There's a lot of stuff you can't talk about. I mean, are you under any sort of contract not to talk to a certain date, or how does it? How does that? Some of the information that we dealt with is declassified after ten years. Some of it is not ever declassified. So, just to be safe, I just don't don't, talk don't to go it. there at all. Right, right, right. Okay, right. Needless to say, what we were doing and. Uh, and what they're doing today is uh, uh, helping to keep our nation safe. Yeah, right, right. Oh, boy. Uh, do you, as you look back on some of the cases, was there any, any times where you were kind of in a hairy situation or it's like, boy, this is... No. Uh, yeah. I think <laughs> if I look back and I think of the things, one of the things that we also did was to support the uh, protective services. And uh, when we were in Germany and the NATO commanders had one of their annual conferences at Ramstein Air Base in Germany, they had all the leaders of the NATO countries come in and they were all staying in the BOQ and they all came in with their own security details. Okay. And of course we were the hosts, the Americans. And uh, so we were the people that were responsible ultimately for security. Um, we were informed that General Jones was a jogger and that he would get up early, early in the morning, put on his jogging clothes and go out of the BOQ and he's going to jog around this field. And we said, well, that's, that's fine. We'll be ready for him. So uh, 
about four o'clock in the morning. I got Al out of bed and I said, come on, we got to get ready. The general's going to be jogging soon. Al says, okay, and he gets on. We put on our suits and our ties and we're just the spiffiest looking special agents he ever saw. And Al goes out in the middle of the field and he's going to watch the general run around the field. And uh, that would be fine if the general stayed around the field. Yeah, oh. The general took off into the housing area. Well, Al took off after him on foot. <laughs> I took after him on foot. We're running like crazy, <laughs> out of breath. The general Jones is the jogger on a regular basis. He doesn't get out of breath. Well, he finally gets back to the BOQ. By this time, agents had been alerted and they were following him in a car. And there must have been a pebble or something in the hubcap of the car. If the general had slowed down, they would have run him over. <laughs> they were that close. So that that was uh, was a funny experience. Uh, mm -hmm. Wow! Oh, just uh, fascinating stuff. And we get to uh, sit in the back room uh, behind the curtain and and listen to all of the talks and hear them all uh, strategizing and talking about you know who's well, whose forces are trustworthy and who's not and who doesn't discipline enough and whose hair's too long and you know would you want to fight alongside of him and uh, just the craziest things. Ah, so it must have been passing to the information you were privy oh, to. Yeah. I mean that yeah. a vast majority of us will never the, the stuff behind the scenes stuff that you know that a vast majority of us will never know about. We did a lot of support for uh, in the technical area for Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. And they would do advanced research on all, I mean, far out things. And uh, it was in the early 70s, we were at Vandenberg Air Force Base where they had a conference. And it was really the start of the internet. Wow. And these guys were working on it. And we didn't know it at the time. And we're sitting behind the curtain and we're going through the RS spectrum looking for what we look for and listening to these talks and they would hand out action items and these engineers from all over the world would go home and they would reconvene in six months in San Diego right? and state us the action items they had. But at that time they were working on the internet. Wow. Uh, and today. Yeah, right. You know, right. It was really interesting. Well, and just, uh, I imagine too, just how quickly technology has advanced I mean, could you imagine doing your job back then, doing it now with oh, all the, uh, with all no, the? No, uh, we, we did a lot of neat things in the surveillance area, putting cameras in ceilings and <laughs> pinhole lenses and taking photographs out of tailpipes of cars and what have you. But today, with the miniaturization, you know, it'd be so much easier yeah. actually. Uh, all right, yeah. You know, we were working yeah. with big bulky cameras. And you'd take a tailpipe and put around the lens of your camera and dangle it uh, through a hole in the floor of the trunk of a car to get a picture of somebody. And then when the car got turned in, you'd get chewed out because uh, they devalued it because of the hole in the trunk. <laughs> uh, wow. Those were over in Germany. Wow. Oh, boy. What a, what a fascinating, <clears throat> fascinating career. Uh, it was good. Yeah. I don't regret uh, any of my time in the Air Force or at Lockheed Martin. As I said earlier, you go from one side of the table to the other. When you're in the Air Force, the government contractor is your servant. When you're on the other side, as a contractor, you're the guy in the hot seat. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So. so you did uh, 20 years then in the Air Force? Got 20 years in the Air Force. Uh -huh. Uh, 19 with Lockheed Martin, yeah. 8 over in Scotland with the hotel, and uh, the rest here in Fort Collins. Yeah. Oh, wow. wow. Still get back east every now and then to hometown of Long Beach and spend some time in the water. You miss the ocean. Yeah, 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 yeah. sure. Of course, when you're back there, you miss the mountains. That's right, that's right. Uh, <laughs> Well, like I said, as we wind down, is there anything else we left out that you can think of, or do you think we've pretty much rounded out your, your story as, as best uh, 
best I we can. I think it's pretty right? much rounded out as best I can. You know, there's a lot and of. I'm sure we got just the know, tip of the iceberg of it. But, yeah, uh, we've got yeah. the tip of the iceberg, but you should get the you know the general yeah. uh, overall career. A lot of this in the surveillance area, and because of my security clearances, and uh, you can only uh, get those with to a clean living. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Well, the last question I like to ask um, with with your military career, I mean, this is kind of a strange question because it, it it's pretty evident with you. But uh, uh, how do you look at, at your Air Force career uh, in the way that it changed your life, affect your life, play a role in your life, or is it which is a chapter in your life. I, I feel kind of funny asking that question because it was such a major part of your life. And but how Well, my 20 years in the Air Force uh, really prepared me for my 19 years at Lockheed Martin. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, uh, you know, I never thought I'd be uh, get into the hotel, restaurant, pub business. Yeah. Because, but I had spent a lot of time on this side of the bar, uh -huh. so now I'm going to be on that side. <laughs> I checked into a lot of hotels that were not so nice, so I knew a good one from a bad one. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So, uh, you know, it just kind of all fit together. Yeah, right, yeah, right. Yeah. It all fit together. Yeah. So now we're here and uh, enjoying uh, Colorado, playing golf a few times a week and nice. doing a little bit of traveling. Good, excellent, excellent. Enjoying the grandchildren. Very good, very good. Well, Guy, I want to thank you for sitting down to uh, tell your fascinating story today, but uh, more importantly, I want to thank you for your service to our country. Well, you're quite welcome. It was my pleasure. This picture was taken outside the uh, non-commissioned officers club at Cameron Air Base in Vietnam. I uh, was there uh, installing radio equipment. While I was uh, running around uh, Vietnam and Southeast Asia installing communications equipment in support of uh, our mission in Southeast Asia, my wife was doing her part as a volunteer with the American Red Cross at the hospital at Clark Air Force Base. Hmm. Time permitting uh, and weather permitting, we would uh, take advantage and have a refreshment uh, at a table alongside of the wall. Uh, sometimes we were alone, sometimes we were being observed from the opposite side of the wall. Now, do you think you were being followed as well uh, by agents on this side? I mean, was not aware of it, hmm. if we were. Hmm. I spoke earlier about uh, a trip uh, from uh, Wiesbaden Air Base to uh, Athens, Greece, in support of a uh, very sensitive investigation. We uh, knew our destination was Athens. We had no idea what the case was, what it was all about. When we got off the plane, we were loaded in a car, driven up into the hills outside of Athens, down a dirt road, into a clearing, and lo and behold, some of my old friends from uh, different OSI divisions we're all gathered together to get our initial briefing. <laughs> wow. <laughs> this plaque was given to me by uh, uh, members of uh, District 70 uh, Technical Investigations Team. It shows the crest for uh, OSI, Air Force Office Special Investigations. The badge at the bottom is called a German Creepo badge. That badge would be utilized when you were dealing with uh, uh, foreign nationals uh, during the course of your investigation and when you showed that you got the same respect and cooperation from a European non-US citizen that you would get from a US citizen when displaying your badge. Hmm. Wow. After culminating uh, at least 10 years of service with the Air Force Office of Special Investigations Upon your departure, you were eligible to receive your badge. Uh, what they did was take your badge number off, put your initials on, so uh, that uh, I guess protected the Air Force and the Inspector General's office and, and the Air Force OSI. But that's a uh, treasured piece of uh, memorabilia that I have. Absolutely.